Welcome to the Wall Street Lab podcast, where we interview top financial professionals and deconstruct their practices to give you an insider look into the world of finance. Hello and welcome to episode number 28 of the Wall Street Lab podcast. And today we are talking about global macro hedge fund strategies. And our guest today is Ottavio Costa, who has been an analyst at Crescat Capital for almost six years now, and he is focusing on global macro. He created a macro model that identifies the current stage of the US economic cycle, and his research has been featured on such niche media, such as Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and he is also a really good friend of uh, Leonardo. So maybe, Leo, why don't you tell us a bit more about uh, Ottavio and what you talked about this week? Sure, Luke, thank you. Yes, uh, Ottavio is a, a very good friend of mine. We've known each other for, uh, I, I would say, 10 years now since college days in St. Louis. And he's a somewhat different guest for us as he's a bit younger than our and our typical guest, but uh, as you will notice from the interview, he really knows his stuff and has quite interesting views on the market in general. Um, and more specifically, we talked about the current state of the U.S. equity markets. And he also uh, shared his views on China, which uh, for some people will will be quite depressing as he is, is, is bearish, but his views are very interesting and very well researched nonetheless. Uh, so if you like to hear about uh, macro strategies and understand what's going on around the world, I think you're going to enjoy this one. Uh, and also for those who are thinking about getting into hedge funds, uh, this is a good way to, to learn what a, an analyst really does. And he, he talks extensively about what he did to acquire the, the knowledge and experience that he, that he does. And this was very interesting. So I hope you enjoy it. And by the way, if you want to follow what Otavio publishes. He is quite active on social media, especially on, on Twitter at Tavi Costa. So he publishes research almost daily. So if you like that kind of thing, um, make sure to follow him there. Really awesome stuff. And before we jump into the episode, please make sure that if we helped you in any way, or if you enjoy listening to the podcast, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts because this helps us to reach further audiences such as yourselves and it really helps us a lot. So now, without further ado, let's jump into the episode. Otavio, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us here at the Wall Street Lab. It's, uh, it's a true pleasure to have you on. Actually, uh, it's the first time that I interview a friend. Uh, you and I have known each other for, I don't know, maybe 10 years now. So it's, it's really great to have you on. Same here, Leo. I, I'm, I was happy to, uh, to be invited to be part of this and uh, also be glad to uh, share a little bit of what I do and uh, some of our thoughts and, and hopefully it will be helpful to your audience as well. Sure. So, so the first question that I like to ask is, how do you explain to people who are not in finance, uh, what is it that you do? Sure. So I, um, I'm a global macro analyst. So I work for a hedge fund here based in Denver. A, de a hedge fund really is a pool of money that we invest in. Uh, we use uh, one strategy. Uh, in our case, we have three strategies. So we come up with investable ideas and uh, we, you know, we go long and short securities. So uh, as, as a global macro analyst, um, I would say that I, 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 you know, I spend most of my time um, looking at data, aggregating data from, from markets in general and, and, and trying to come up with, uh, with a macro narrative that, that makes sense for us not just to invest and, uh, but, but to, uh, to make sense of what's happening in the world and, and see how we can uh, protect and grow our clients' uh, capital. So um, I would say that's uh, the simplest version of uh, what, what we do. Okay, sure. So, so you mentioned you have three strategies. What are they? Sure, we have a global macro strategy, and uh, which is our flagship fund. 
um, and our strategy. And the second one would be a long short equity um, hedge fund. And the third one would be a long only large cap um, separately managed account. And um, so, yeah, those are the three ones. And but the global macro is, uh, I would say, is, is the flagship is the one that that gets most attention just because we, we can do uh, it's a multi class uh, uh, hedge fund. So we, we can really do anything that has um, enough liquidity in the markets. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's it's it'd be interesting if we focus on the global macro because we haven't had a global macro uh, hedge fund on the show yet. But you mentioned that you look at different uh, types of data every day. Um, can you maybe share what exactly uh, you look at every day to make the decisions that you mentioned you need to make? Sure. I, if I would separate my day, uh, usually I, I try to spend my morning. My morning, I, I usually spend reading a lot of, of the news and I try to go through, you know, really anything that is uh, available out there that I that I find uh, uh, constructive and uh, and uh, and good sources uh, from, you know, Bloomberg, Reuters, uh, Wall Street Journal and any political, uh, you know, I'm very agnostic on, on political views. I try to be very, very open minded for 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 reading when I'm reading news um, and getting, you know, different opinions from every angle, really. Um, and then then later on, as the market is, is, is open, I guess, right around like 11, 10 a.m. And this obviously this all can vary. But um, I try to spend more time uh, aggregating data and, and really looking at the markets first. So seeing what's happening in the markets, if there is anything that I find it interesting, any narrative that I, you know, that I disagree with it, um, because of the news or whatever. And, and a strong, let's say, if we have a strong position in precious metals and precious metals are are doing uh, really bad on that day and uh, for a reason that I completely disagree. And uh, obviously, this is not just me. It's me and Kevin Smith or uh, CIO, um, um, and uh, if we do have an, a strong opinion about something, that's that's a part a part of the day that we usually try to uh, take an action and uh, in the portfolio. Um, and I would say that the big bulk of the day is is spent on aggregating data. So, in your question, what type of data? Um, I would say it come it, it it varies from from company data, so SEC filings that I try to aggregate and. And put it all in a, and create models that that really drive us to come up with themes. So our, our themes come from from our models, or macro models, or equity fundamental model models. And uh, so I get, you know, sometimes I get um, a lot of data from from uh, credit markets. Uh, I, probably my favorite to uh, really dig in. And I think that there's a lot of it, it tends to serve as a bellwether for stocks. And um, it's it's one of my favorite uh, markets to really. Uh, make sure understand what's uh, w- w- what are they pricing in and and how are they looking at the markets and sometimes it's very interesting to see how 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 that is um, th- how that differs from from country to country and and company to company too. So uh, I think most of the times uh, that we spend is is building models that help us to uh, and it's again it's, it's not a systematic way of I mean we we try to build models that drive ideas but but it's a it's um, a very much a discretionary um, uh, strategy so um. so so how do those models look like are those a pool of different indicators that you weight differently based on on the the predictive ability of that indicator or how, do, how does that look like in practice yeah so the models are, are I mean we have so many models I'll give an example of, of, of one uh, that we built uh, maybe two or three years ago we built something we call the macro model Crescent macro model and um, I think it's uh, on page uh, six of the deck of charts that um, you'll be sharing uh, but um, essentially um, it's uh, so it's a 16 factor model that looks at economic indicators that tend to correlate very highly with with the changes in the business cycle in general uh, here in the US and also we, we fit a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, fundamental measurements that we we try to look at companies um, that that tend to work really well historically. So, such as I'll give you a few examples that we like to look at. Just you know, the Schiller Cape ratio we adjust for margins. We we looked at in the economic indicator. We looked at things like you know, unemployment rate, which is a great contrarian indicator. Conf- consumer confidence is another one that tends to be high at the peak of a cycle. The r- rate of change of the Fed funds rate, which you know, Fed always tends to uh, uh, rent, uh, raise rates at the at the peak of a cycle. 
Um, so things like that, things that we found in the in the past that worked in in previous uh, markets and, um, and 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 that are likely to work today. So uh, you know, we try to line them up in, in answering your question on a weight basis. Uh, they're all different, and this one in this case is an equal weighted model, which it, I like it a lot doing equal weighted just because uh, it, it becomes very unbiased. Now there are models that we build that is you know it's it's actually related on on the statistics. So if 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 there is a strong correlation of whatever we're liking we're, we're looking at, um, it, it will have a higher weight. So the weight is is related to uh, how how strong uh, correlated uh, is is the particular uh, index or or whatever the number we're looking at. The third thing that we looked at in this macro model is is technicals. Uh, we have a few technical indicators just to help us on timing a bit. Uh, the technical indicators are very um, the simple things are not uh, really nothing is is too complex. The model itself is very simple, which is uh, perhaps why we like it so much. And um, and then we work on backtesting those models quite a lot. Um, and uh, we know that it, 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 there's not a, a simple answer for it because models, uh, you know, there there are a lot of models that could work, could have worked in the past really well, and. Um, correlations tend to change in in, in the future, so um, it's uh, it's it's hard to predict uh, how you know w- what are correlations that will be strong in the future, and how do you position yourself according to that? So back testing is a big part of it. Um, uh, so in this model, we go back to 1987, I believe, and we score from zero to 100. So 100 being what we call the overvalue and late cycle. Um, and uh, if it's above the 85th percentile range of that score is um, is usually a, a time of the market that we we like to be holding more risk off assets, uh, more defensive uh, positions. And uh, when when we're on the opposite side, uh, more in the 15th percentile of that score, it's something that gives us more conviction to be uh, to be buyers of of risk on assets like stocks in general and uh, things like that. So. Uh, so it's it's not fully you know we, we we strongly rely on those models but they're not not it's not uh, all that we we do I mean it's a it's it's a big part of it though. Hmm. I'm curious to hear because I'm I'm assuming that there are some indicators that you come across some things that have worked in the past let's say some some indicator tends to be high prior to a recessionary period. Uh, and that has been the case, let's say, in the last three recessions. But there might be other indicators that are maybe uh, driving that specific one that you're looking at. Um, so how do you make sure that you're looking at the source um, of, of, of that movement rather than just a derivative of it? No, I'll, I'll try to answer. And if I'm not answering right, you let me know, too. But um, I, I think that, um, well, you know, factors, like I said, some factors work really well in previous recessions and others, uh, they just, you know, they're flagging uh, 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 problems and they're, you know, they really doesn't materialize itself. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tricky. How do you, how do you know which factor is, is a good factor, which factor is, it won't work in this environment because uh, maybe we have, you know, a much larger central bank balance sheet than we had in other uh, periods of, of market peaks and so forth. So, you know, there are always um, some um, um, interesting, uh, uh, it's, it's always unique, right? Every cycle will be unique in some, in some way. So, uh, but, but at the same time, they all rhyme. Uh, on on um, with, it, with with themselves, and what we think it's interesting is when you can when you can line up you know a, a huge a, a, a significant amount of of macro timing indicators that can um, that can really drive you to to the same idea. And I'll give an example. We we're looking at um, uh, the other day um, at thirty year yields of of, uh, of sovereign uh, 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 bonds in general in, in you know several countries, and we re- realized that thirty year yields are lower than Fed funds rate. Uh, and Fed funds rates an overnight rate. Uh, we thought that that was quite interesting, and um, and then uh, put it back in history, and you can see that. Uh, that tends to happen every time you're at the peak of a cycle. And, you know, so uh, today we have an unprecedented amount of, what, 15 countries that have uh, that imbalance um, in, in credit markets. And and then, you know, the next question really is, what does that mean, right? Is it is that just, uh, we thought that really the, the, the big bulk of it was, oh, it's a global yield curve inversion. And and it's, you know, it works very similar to, uh, to you know, any yield curve inversion that like in the U.S., the two versus tens and three month versus tens and things like that. 
Now, um, you know, going back in history, and when you see that, that that's a development that tends to happen uh, every time at the peak of the cycle, well, that's, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of interesting. And I know there's a lot of people who come up and say, well, but there are not a lot of data. You're only looking at two, uh, two recession uh, uh, periods, really, 2006 and 2000. And 2000. Um, and, and it's absolutely right. But when, when the idea itself of the factor makes sense, right? I mean, it makes sense why you're, you're seeing an inversion, really, and it's, it's negative for global stocks. And when you line up other things uh, in, in, the same, in the same token, um, and then it, it really starts to get really interesting. And that's what drives you to build models, really, because you want to you kind of include all those, you know, all those factors that, that tend to work well in the past and, and see if you, if you put them all together, what, what is that going to look like? Is that going to be a, um, is that going to show you that you, you know, you're really, um, up to, um, to, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're overdue for a recession or, or, or a collapse in markets or, or, or the opposite. Maybe you're not, maybe you're, maybe you're in the early cycle of, of something. So, the, the goal really is to uh, not be too hung up on one factor, but instead build, you know, a, a, a really a, a deck of charts of, of, of great timing indicators that, that can show you your narrative very well. So let's say, you, you know, you're looking at your models and, 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 and they are screaming for you to, to put an allocation to a specific instrument or to a specific trade. You know, I think I think it was uh, Keynes that said that the markets can stay irrational longer than uh, you can stay solvent. So, how do you make sure you're not buying too early or too late into a, a trend? Very tricky question. I, I don't think anybody <laughs> can really answer that one, but I'm gonna try. Uh, I think that. Um well, we, I think building models is, is, is one thing is, is to, uh, I think the, the goal of it is obviously not to be too early, but one of the things I learned with, uh, Kevin Smith is that a, a lot of people say that I'll give an example of something that we, we tend to hear, like, you know, inversions in the yield curve, for instance, yield, mm -hmm. uh, uh, two versus stands or the three month versus 10 year yields being inverted recently. And a lot of people have been saying, well, 2006 was a time when, when also inverted and took another two years until the recession started. And it, the funny thing is that that's not necessarily true. I mean, it, it's true in the terms of the S&P 500, and, but there are really bombs setting off globally in financial markets during that period. Um, you know, the housing prices were peaking. You had mortgage stocks were starting to uh, fall apart. You have home um, builders are starting to fall apart as well. So there are really a lot of things happening. Actually, Kevin had a really good year during that period of time, even though the markets were not collapsing. Like overall market was still going up during that time, but there were pockets of the market that were already um, showing a lot of weakness. So, um, at, you know, being early, too early, obviously, ba is bad. But being early is not necessarily bad if you if you know where the source is coming from. As far as uh, you know, let's say here in this market, uh, perhaps we've we've hearing a lot of people saying about corporate debt being being the big source of it. Uh, we we tend to agree with that. And you know, if you start seeing the corporate debt showing um, you know strong signs of of um, of I don't know of weakness, that that would be t perhaps the the reason for for positioning the portfolio properly and 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 being able to capture much earlier than 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 the actual market falling apart. So I, it, it, it's it's tricky to know when you're too early. I mean, it's um, uh, at the same time, like for instance, we had 2017. We had a bad year in the fund. We're too early. Um, what we did to approach that was we wanted to prove ourselves that our thesis was was correct. So we we spent a lot of time. That was the time we wrote our best invest in, uh, investment letters. Really, we just said, well, let's just uh, focus on the research. Let's just really try to. Uh, Go back to our um, to to what we do and 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 see if if the data that we're looking at is is accurate and 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 the thesis is still valid. So um, you know we validated the the thesis and and guess what? 2018, uh, yeah, we're too early in 2017 and 2018 paid off. You know we're one of the funds that were able to capitalize early on and the, you know and 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 be really have a a great uh, record for the whole year. So it. It, it's tricky. I, I don't think to, anybody can ever really answer that question uh, correctly. But uh, our goal is to, uh, you know, in, work intensely on on why we, we could be wrong on the thesis. And it's it's. Uh, I think that that's uh, that's the biggest part of it. And and you're right. Sometimes the markets are, uh, they they you know they move in the wrong direction for a really long time. 
we have that issue. I mean, we're having that issue right now with the, with the Chinese currency. We, I mean, we we strongly believe the Chinese currency is massively overvalued. And I love giving real examples of, of things of, that we have in the portfolio. So that's a great one. I mean, are we wrong about our thesis? I mean, is it is it really, you know, we've been talking about this for five, four years, and we had the mini deval in, in August of 2015, Early on, we're you know we're one of the only funds that really had this position on, and um, and and it paid off at the time. And since then, it hasn't really paid off. I mean, 2018 was a great year for that, but now this year hasn't really been a great year for that. So are we you know are we wrong about it? And so so proving that thesis correctly is is I think it's key is 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 to. Uh, it's to really make sure you're you're putting the work to see if uh, if if your thesis is uh, if if there isn't anything there that is that is off on 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 validating uh, the whole investment idea. So uh, I, I I don't know another way to answer besides really working really hard on on validating um, the idea than than uh, yeah. So so uh, from from what I understand, and you sent me a deck, and by the way, for everyone who's listening, we will share some of those slides that we're talking about during the interview. So uh, if you can't follow it now, just go to the website and you'll have it ready there. So, so the way it works, as far as I understand it, you have... Uh, a number of ideas or, or themes and, and your portfolio is constructed around those ideas. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, we, we, we bucket them in, in, into themes, correct. Um, in, in the presentation that you sent me at the very beginning, you talk about three themes, mm -hmm. uh, three high conviction ideas that you have. Could you please maybe talk about one of them and just go through the, the whole process? So how did you actually come up with it and, and how does that look like in practice and, uh, and the types of, of, of instruments that you, that you can use to, uh, to express those, those convictions? Oh, I love that question. All right. So, um, well, uh, uh, the the three high convictions uh, conviction themes really are. The, if you if you looked at the, at the slide before, which has all literally all the themes that we have in the portfolio today, some of them are are related. You know, I'll give an example like the Asian contagion is is highly related to, or China credit bus theme. So they really pretty much the same idea, but. I think the U.S. equities is a great one. Uh, we have, you know, we're we have a, a high conviction idea of, of of how stocks are are truly at record valuations today, and um, and so um, the way we we found that was was really looking at all fundamental factors of of our models that uh, that we looked at from you know from EV to sales to to uh, um, EV to free cash flow and adjusting for margins and seeing how margins are peaking. Um, and things like that, and then, and then we're like, well, well, um, is there something on on the economical side as well, aside from from valuations? Uh, um, and we started to find, uh, um, and, you know, some some signs in the credit markets are um, showing perhaps uh, that we're overdue for recession, and and um, and then we started to find things like you know the consumer confidence um, uh, indicator, um, and so you know it really was a, 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 a there was a, a mosaic of 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 things. Things that we're we're just uh, kind of building this puzzle of of of, of all these um, ideas that that prove that markets are, are close to a peak level here in in the U.S. markets. Um, and and how do you tactically uh, position the portfolio? Well, um, we use so we have Kevin built this model of maybe 20 years ago, and it's it's mostly focusing on on the 2,000 most liquid stocks in the world. And um, and our way to really approach this theme was to find what are the most overvalued companies in the U.S. today. And um, and a lot of times you you realize that you're actually looking at uh, same industries all the time, and 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 perhaps there's something there of, of maybe an industry or a sector that is historically overvalued um, that comes up from a model idea. Uh, one great example from that uh, that is part of our uh, portfolio today and is part of this theme of U.S. equities that we think is historically overvalued, I believe that that one is in our page uh, maybe 17. Um, and it's looking at utilities, and uh, we realized that utility stocks were scoring very poorly in their model and historically uh, overvalued. They have a, a, a ton of leverage uh, in their balance sheets, and they're not making any money on a free cash flow basis. 
um, and I'm talking about in a more general way. Um, and, and we thought there was something there. So we started to dig in and uh, realize that um, on, on that chart that I'm referring to, we're looking at S and, uh, the treasuries, U.S. treasuries versus utility stocks and realize that every time uh, utilities are <laughs> – since 1995, I should never say every time, but since 1995 – uh, when utility stocks begin to to fall as treasuries begin to rise or to to rally, um, is is a time that you're at the peak of a cycle, and you start seeing that by looking at correlation. The rolling correlation on a weekly basis uh, it starts to turn negative, and right when it turns negative, guess what? You're you know it, it also coincide with the peak of a cycle. So it, that's an example of a sector that was really uh, it began. It, it really began through the through this model that, that Kevin created. Um, the idea came from there, and then uh, we overlay with with the macro opinion or, or macro research, and 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 it, it all made sense. And we're like, well, you know, I, I think that perhaps utilities um, have, you know, if if you look at just the implied volatility of utilities because they tend to be seen as, as a very defensive investments in general. They're, they, you know, people think that they don't fall as much as, as, as the market falls. But actually, uh, what we found that is interesting is that utility stocks fell close to like 48%, 50% in tech bust and another 40% in, in the global financial crisis in 08. So, you know, when when you find something like that, you start, it, it, it's it's kind of interesting on the side of the derivatives markets, right? I mean, how can you apply an investment there if, if you know, what it, what could be mispriced? And is there a tail event that is perhaps mispriced in, in utilities? Well, Maybe you know put options could be a could be a good way to implementing. So we're you know one way of expressing that thesis would be being long put options on utility stocks and utilities uh, ETFs and so forth. So I think that that's a a, a very realistic um, uh, example of how we we kind of constructed that mm. that theme. Um, I'm happy to talk about the other ones too. But just just one question uh, from that you set this you set up this question for me uh, when you said that uh, you you should never say always and you're looking at data starting in 1995. Did yeah. you look at data prior to that and, and did you mm. did you notice the same behavior? Oh, I'm always trying to go as far as I can on anything I do. Um, and, uh, and, um, but you know, sometimes you can't like, especially some, if you go and, you know, looking at data for some companies, unfortunately we can't go back further than, than the nineties for, for, uh, a few sectors and, and companies specific, uh, the Dow goes back further. So that's kind of, kind of nice. If you want to look at correlations, I think that that's a uh, one way to, uh, to um, to approach this, uh, no, I'm always. Um, uh, I mean, another example. I mean, it's uh, from from the data. You know, looking at historical data, for instance, I think that the biggest bullish argument today in the markets is that PE ratios are cheap, right? PE ratios are not expensive. We've seen it a lot worse before. And that's not necessarily true because I think that uh, when people are looking at P.E. ratios, they forget that earnings tend to be good at the peak of a cycle and companies tend to have their best margins at the peak of a cycle. You can see that just by plotting margins uh, historically and you see exactly this this pattern. Um, so um, what we found is that, well, what if we look at P.E. ratios at market at prior market peaks and if you go use the Schiller, it's free. It's a Schiller, the Cape ratio uh, Schiller data, and they also provide a PE ratio on that um, on that spreadsheet. And you can go back to 1871. And since 1871, PE ratios in the U.S. are are the second highest in in, in a market peak. Uh, the only time it was higher was in 2000. Every single time was actually higher than 1929, 2007, 1968, and goes the list goes on all the way to 1871. So you know, these are all. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm always um, um, trying to find as much history as I can. I think history is your friend. So uh, if you uh, if you can use it, uh, use it because it's um, um, not every time you, you'll be able to uh, unfortunately go back decades and and different you know macro setups that we had like in the 60s, 70s. They're, they're completely macro uh, different macro setups that we have today. You know, you had a, a rising inflationary kind of environment and 
I know we're not necessarily seeing as much of that right now. I mean, we could see it soon, but not necessarily right now. So, you know, how do you how do you know, you know, how do you know it's going to play out exactly like 08 in 2000? So, you know, you're absolutely right. You always want to go back as much as you can and 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 see if you, I mean, especially politically, uh, things are very different uh, in, um, in 08 and in, in 2000 as well. So, and geopolitically uh, speaking as well, um, I guess, uh, with China and the U.S., I mean, what we have seen today is is, is 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 very different than we saw in the peak of the other, you know, two recent um, uh, recessions. So it's, uh, um, it's important to go back in history as much as you can. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've been talking about uh, the imminent crisis for... I don't know, maybe you probably know this better than I do, uh, maybe the last three years at least um, as, as, as the cycle has is, is, is been extended after the Trump uh, election. So uh, um, it's, it's difficult for investors such as ourselves here, and, and I'm talking about my day job, but to time the market in any way. But since this is your, your day-to-day job, I'm wondering uh, how long, much longer can this go? Uh, and I'm talking about your U.S. equities theme. Yeah, so we we think that the markets really peaked in in September of 2018, and we've now started a, a bear market period, and the mar- bear market now uh, turned into a bear market rally uh, since January. Um, we literally everything went up during that month. I think uh, you look at VIX now, uh, volatility for stocks. I guess that's one way to measure that. Uh, some people may disagree with this, but uh, but if you look at VIX, is uh, what's interesting <laughs> it, on a monthly basis was the largest decline in VIX since uh, the third largest since 1990s. So it was really a shrinkage of of vol and during that period. Now, um, you know, on on the business cycle getting extended it was very interesting. 2016, uh, very early on the year, you know, we had the 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 rate hike in in December 2015, and then. Later on, uh, the markets crashed significantly. I think it was a correction of what close to twenty percent or so, and then and then and then the business cycle got extended, and then the Fed completely capitulated um, and said they were not going to be raising rates anymore. And the business cycle got extended, and then the Trump came in, and 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 that was the entire hype period again, and um, and and markets just kept going higher. So you're right. I mean, that was you know everyone's been talking about this. When is it going to happen? And and now we're we're hearing from people. Well, now the Fed is going to pause rates again. Are we in another 2016 scenario? And I, you know, I I strongly believe that we're not seeing um, you know the similarities with that at all, actually. And uh, I think that the best chart to explain that would be I, I think it's uh, on page. Let's see here. Uh, I don't know exactly what page it is. Is the percentage of inversions uh, in the yield curve? So right. uh, I, I, look I'm the, on it right now. Yeah. Yeah, that chart is incredible. I mean, look back in 2016, what the percentage of inversions in the U.S. yield curve uh, was. It, it was it was really nothing. I, I think I should explain what this chart really is because I don't think it's very easy to explain to uh, to understand it uh, just looking at it. But uh, uh, it's actually very simple. It's it's looking at all possible spreads in in the yield curve in the U.S. So there are 44 really, and you know we go back from 30 year yields, 10 year yields, seven year yields, all the way to Fed funds rate, overnight rate. You're looking at all the spreads there, and you, and, and, and you can see how many of those are inverted. And today, that number actually shot up. It, it's wrong. It's sitting 38%. It's actually 60, close to 60% today. And uh, in, in 2016, that wasn't even close. So when, when you start seeing a signal like that in credit markets, I mean, you, you have to be at least – a little bit scary about what what's likely to happen here in the near future. We think that uh, that gives us, uh, you know, aside from all the other macro indicators that just I could show you here, but um, this is this is a really big one. I mean, it's it's incredible. It's uh, credit markets are telling you there's there's perhaps you know they're pricing in what we think it's an inevitable recession here in the near term, and so. I mean, it. Um, I think that that just gives you conviction of thinking. Uh, did we start already a bear market here? And and people say, well, but the percentage of inversions in tw- 2006 was was high and took another two years until things really started to play out. And I love that argument because it completely ignores what happened in 2000. In 2000 actually coincide perfectly with the market top uh, when when we were above the 50 percent of 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 inversions in the U- U- U.S. yield curve. So, you know, there are a lot of similarities. Go back to history. There's another one that I, I should mention that I, I think gives a lot of conviction. 
1973, uh, if you look at three-month yields versus 10-year yields, which got a lot of attention recently because it got inverted last week. Um, now, what, what's interesting about that one is that if, if you look at 1973, there was an inversion. Nobody's talking about this. And But in 1973, the bear market started first. And then about five to six months later, there was an inversion in, in the yield curve in three months versus 10 year. And that was exactly at a period where which was, uh, was a bear market rally. And it was about a 16% retracement from, from, the bear, from the beginning of the bear market. Um, and guess what? Today, we we think that the market peaked in 2018 in September 20th. And uh, right pre- precisely about oh, five to six months later, we now had the first inversion. So it's playing out very similarly on what we think it's also a bear market rally. So, um, you know, you start looking at all the similarities in, in, in history. We think that it's, um, uh, you know, I, I think people are going to be surprised on where S&P 500 could be trading and in, in in, at, by the end of the year or so, so um, we're going to stay well positioned for for that. And for for wrong, that's part of the business, I guess. But um, I, I think we have a lot of reasons on why on why we think that um, that markets are, are are poised to collapse here uh, sometime soon. Okay, this is great. So you talked about U.S. equities and metals, uh, but actually, the one that I'm most curious about is is the third one, which is China. Can you maybe talk about your thesis on that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the China theme really starts by looking at more of a big macro picture, and that's I think that's a good way to understand our process as well. We you know we go back a little you know, some steps and, and try to see what's happening in the world. And uh, when we looked at uh, I think this chart is on page eighteen, and it's looking at total debt to GDP ratio of several countries in the world and. Uh, what's interesting about that chart is is that if you look past credit bubbles of the last 30 years um, and total debt to GDP and, and, and the red bar, it's looking at a average uh, average of, of total debt to GDP of, of of the largest credit bubbles we had in, in the last 30 years, all the way back to Japan in the 1990s, to the Asian crisis, to the to the um, to the housing bubble, to the European debt crisis, and the average of total debt to GDP during those. Uh, during the peak of those markets was close to 245 percent. So today in 2018, 2019 now, but this number is from 2018. Uh, that's as 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 as, uh, as recent as as we can go. It's close to 269 percent of of the average of the top countries with total debt to GDP today. So it's it's well above what it was at the peak of all this credit bubble. So what is the at the at the center of all these imbalances? Uh, we think it's China. Uh, it's it's not you know obviously there it's it's spread out to the to the rest of the world too. But but China is a big part of it, and you can see that by looking at on balance sheet banking assets in China. Um, which are close to what 300% of GDP, and well above what it was in the U.S. housing bubble, and and well above what it was in the European debt crisis in 2011. Um, and that's not even including off balance sheet. So off balance sheet, they report this uh, thing that's called the financial stability report every December. So on an annual basis, they report this, and um, they admit it to another 45 trillion dollars of of off balance sheet assets on that report. So you know, I'm just I'm being conservative by looking at the 40 trillion, but it could be as much as 90 trillion dollars of of assets relative to GDP. So I find that very interesting. But just looking at again on balance sheet, just the growth in the banking assets in China since the global financial crisis, it's close to 400 percent. So you know, it 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 completely dwarfs you know places uh, places like the U.S. and Japan and the eurozone. I think that's on the chart on uh, slide 20. Uh, it's a very interesting chart. It's a huge, it's a 400% growth in the normalized terms. Uh, so the chart is normalized. And um, so, you know, what is the, all the, what's the consequential damage of of, of that? I mean, it, it, is it, you know, is it going to hurt the, the the stock market, the, the bond market or, or the currency market? That's kind of, you know, us, you know, we have an idea. How do we implement this now? Well, um, net, last year we thought that the stocks were, you know, still were, were a great way to implement this trade. So we shorted a bunch of Chinese stocks, and that went up really well. That worked for us, um, and we were also short the currency. But this year we're more focused on the currency side. And uh, this, uh, the next chart, uh, where, which is interesting, is looking at the current account change in China. It's a structural change in China. Current account since the global financial crisis in China 
is shrinking significantly. I believe it's close to nine percentage points of shrinkage on current account to GDP. Um, so it's it's um, it's it's a problem. And uh, when you looked at that, it's China is the only country in the world that shrinked its balance, its current account significantly, and its currency actually appreciated against the dollar. Um, so, you know, the other countries that are very close to China would be Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia. They're all peg currencies, if you think about it. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting, like Argentina, Argentina lost close to eight, nine percent of eight percent of of um, uh, of its current account shrank during since the global financial crisis. Its currency devalued by close to 90 percent. So, you know, we start seeing, you know, an indebted growth model like China with with a current account that is shrinking, um, that is about to turn negative, maybe. Um, it's very close. It's close to zero. Um, how, how do you how do you sustain that? I mean, it's you know, so we found that the currency is the best way to play this this imbalance. And uh, there are several ways. I mean, the PBOC, the Chinese central bank is going to um, try to boost the economy. We think that China. So in the fourth quarter of 2018, Chinese, the median Chinese stock was down close to 40 percent. 40%. I don't know in history any country that its 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 stock market was down, its median stock price was down close to 40% and the economy wasn't closed or already in a recession. So you know, and then right after that fourth quarter, uh, China came out or the Chinese government came up saying uh, they're going to be targeting somewhere close to six and a half percent growth in GDP. I mean, it's it's really it makes no sense. Um, and then. You know, the argument that we hear the most is, well, but, you know, it's a communist country. Aren't they, isn't a government have, you know, a full um, control over, over the economy and are able to perhaps even uh, fix up the situation somehow? Well, first of all, if you look at the amount of non-performing loans in the system, which we think it's close to, what, 20 percent of of, um, of of all the, the own balance sheet banking assets uh, in China today, well, if they're going to be writing off those non-performing loans, they're going to have to be printing a lot more money than 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 what people are, are, are pricing in today. And if that's the case, that's just a dilution of the currency, and the currency is going to be the one that is likely to suffer. Um, one way to look at that is is looking at the uh, what you know. One way they 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 lower the required deposit reserve ratio twice this year already on their major banks. And um, if you track that line, which I think it's on slide 22, if you track that line, it actually tracks the CNY USD very, very closely, all the way back to 2000, so or 2001. Uh, and and very recently, we've had this divergence between the two lines. In other words, the Chinese currency has been appreciating while um, while this ratio has been um, uh, um, being uh, lowered. So it's uh, you know it's just another another um, another uh, I guess support for for the thesis. But uh, um, and and the other thing we're seeing in the next chart is it's kind of interesting because in line with this is is um, we've seen recently the stocks Chinese stocks have been on fire since the beginning of the year. I mean I think they're up like what close to twenty percent or something. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Um, and and at the same time the currency has been appreciating at the same time. How do you assimilate the economy? Like that, and at the same time, you don't have any issues in your currency, I, and it's very—I mean, it's—it's it's really odd what's happening. I, and if you look at the correlation, the 52-week rolling correlation of the two, uh, which is on chart 23, it's at the highest uh, correlation um, ever. I mean, uh, I mean, as as much as the data goes back to, which is 1990s, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's—it's it's really, I—I uh, I really think it's unsustainable. I, uh, we, there's some history books that you can read about. The Chinese monetary system and how many times it reset their monetary uh, regime um, in in history, really in the last century, is 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 remarkable. So uh, we, we're we're thinking that this is uh, uh, very likely to play out similarly, and and that the Chinese currency will devalue significantly. Um, and you have to think about that uh, very strongly. Uh, what 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 does you know a, a yuan, let's say, for right in a uh, USDCNY. Um, trading at close to, you know, maybe uh, seven and a half or so. What would that mean to the world? Um, I have so many takeaways from that. And it's a very interesting train of thought. But um, mm -hmm. 
but uh, uh, anyways, for portfolio reasons, that's how we're positioned today. We're, we're we have long put options on CNY and the Hong Kong dollar, which is it's almost like China. Um, it's it's really similar, really, um, and um, and and actually a lot cheaper. Uh, in terms of you know imply vol since it's a, also a pack currency but it's it has a very a much more narrow band of of of, of trading um, on a daily basis uh, the Hong Kong dollar so it's a it's a very um, I don't know attractive way of in our view to uh, to position a portfolio this is all quite, all fascinating, quite fascinating and yeah. depressing at the same time <laughs> but uh, uh, sorry well, <laughs> <laughs> no but it's 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 definitely uh, very interesting and, and and quite unique research uh, while I have you on the line and and given you're a Brazilian um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on 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 Brazil um, if you have one yes and uh, before I say that I just want to say one thing which I think it's in line with what you said uh, um, by the way, this is not coming from a person who is uh, considered uh, uh, permanently negative about the markets. I, I don't have a view like that. I, I, we're tactically uh, bearish right now, and we're happy when, when macro indicators turn the other way, we're going to be happy to be you know long things that are, we think we should be long. So it's, it's really a tactical position. On Brazil, um, well, <clears throat> I think it's really hard to be uh, to be. Um, uh, to be thinking that Brazil is going to do really well in a scenario like that. I mean, it, uh, you can see that, you know, uh, the, if they want the values um, and Brazil, Brazil is, is a commodity driven country. And you look at that by looking at uh, year over year change of Ibo Vespa versus year over year change of industrial metals. Um, and it's very interesting. It's been diverging recently. Industrial metals are uh, on a year over year basis. We're, um, we're, we're going lower and Ibo Vespa has been going higher, uh, kind of a nonstop kind of move really more recently. It's been, um, it's been, um, um, I, I guess a selling off a bit, but, uh, it, it's been a nonstop, uh, vertical move on, on Brazilian stocks for the last uh, months or so since the Bolsonaro, uh, effect, um, and um, now I don't, you know, I'm, I, I think there's a delusional overcrowding uh, on emerging markets uh, recently, and I, I, I'm not a believer of that at all. I, I, I see there's some very in intelligent managers um, bullish on emerging markets relative to to uh, to U.S. stocks, and I, I, I can see that as a thesis. But if if the markets are going to be, I, I'm much rather allocate um, our capital of the funds in, into something that I, I really see ourselves uh, paying off well if, if there is really a recession globally then then something that will work relative to something else um, and but it's still hurt the portfolio so I um, you know that's kind of the goal really I mean if we're we're trying to time something we have a very high conviction on um, now um, I think that um, yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm more on the bear a lot more on the bearish side we have very very small position in the short side on Ibo Vis, but it's not very high. But what's interesting about Brazil is if you look at the monetary uh, policy um, of the last few years and look at the Tasha Selic, which is the equivalent to the Fed funds rate in the US, and look at the Fed funds rate versus the Tasha Selic. And what you see is that there is this you know massive monetary stimulus by the Brazilian central bank for the last three to four years, all the way back to the the this you know the largest recession in history in 2014 or so, um, and that you know that that came up, that came and it kind of explains why you have such a run up on stocks in Brazil. But at the same time, it came out with one cost, right? The cost of the currency. The currency devalues significantly. Um, and uh, I think the spread between Tasha Selic and 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 Fed funds rate is is as at the lowest level in in, in history. Um, again, when I say history, is as much as I can go back to. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's it's really uh, it's really interesting because it, it tells you the story very well. It's it's been it's been pumping up stocks in in Brazil, but the, the currency has been you know having a, a terrible last four years or so. I mean, the currency devalues significantly. Uh, against the dollar, and um, so uh, you know, if, if I could, you know, if I could position well, if I could have, if I if I would have to position myself on Brazil, I think that uh, on the short side, uh, Brazilian stocks in local currency terms look quite attractive. Um, 
But again, I, I, I do find some other things that are a little bit more interesting out there. But it's gravity, right? Things that go up a lot will tend to go <laughs> lower also <laughs> quite a lot. So if, if there is a recession and, and, and markets tend to go from, from um, a boom to bust very quickly. And, uh, and if we do have something like that, I think Brazilian stocks could be caught up big time. And we, we found that it's very interesting um, in research, too, that we did on liquidity uh, in in emerging markets, but more focused on China. So you remember that there was the Hong Kong Shanghai Connect a few years ago, um, and uh, they they calculate this daily turnover. It's a call daily sell turnover. It's really daily liquidity of stocks you now of money going flowing from uh, almost like money flowing from Hong Kong to to Shanghai for investments in Shanghai and we saw liquidity was 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 rising significantly at the beginning of the year kind of in 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 line with with the rally in Chinese stocks and very recently we've seen um, that liquidity now that daily liquidity was plunging like 40% and so you go back and, and see what that you know looks like when every time you have a plunge like this in history, really interesting. Every time is is um, uh, I think those two times that the, that really happened. It was in uh, very early in 2018 when markets began to collapse, and the other one was in 2015. Again, t- Chinese stocks have come down quite a lot. It's it's it's, it's not a as attractive as they were a year ago, but. But I, I find that um, um, maybe you know a bit attractive uh, given how much they've they've gone up recently. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, um, I'm I hope I'm not depressing your viewer or your, <laughs> your audience. But um, um, <laughs> we do have a very bearish stance right now, and uh, um, hoping to uh, you know, once things play out, uh, you know, completely switch that that view. Yeah, uh, I mean the good thing about this is. Um, this will be recorded and will be online forever. So we'll be able to test your hypotheses in a few months. Maybe we'll have a second version of this in a year or so and see what has happened. Um, uh, but thank Absolutely. you for that. I mean, uh, this is uh, this is quite fascinating. Let's 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 switch uh, gears a little bit now. And uh, what I'm what I'm really curious to know is how the hell did you learn about all this? I mean, was it all on the job? Did you read books? What did you focus on? Where, where can people get to the level you are today in terms of understanding of, of macroeconomics and, and, and markets? Well, I, I, I read a lot. I, I read a lot of IMF, BIS reports. I read a lot of um, reports from other people that I find that are, that are interesting and read them. Um, I know you interview the guy from Market Wizards. Anyways, I, I read a lot of his books. I read I read a lot of books, so Howard Marks, and and I uh, use a lot of Audible books. Actually, Audible books are great because I go a lot for runs and I, I try to uh, be effective with my time. There's not a lot of time in the day to uh, do all the things I want to do. So every time I'm working out, I'm re- I'm usually listening to a book or a podcast. And uh, mm-hmm. um, I think that um, for me, what worked was was being in an ongoing meeting with with Kevin Smith um, and uh, and in you know in trying to learn and, and challenge sometimes in, in a good way by the way is challenge him and his thoughts and you know why you know maybe he could be wrong on something because obviously when I when I came um, to work for Crasket, uh, um I didn't know much about about what I was doing and I was I was just really uh, uh, kind of following Kevin um, and uh, uh, for me, it was really a breakthrough when I, I started to um, to to kind of challenge his thoughts in a good way, in a very a healthy way, and um, I think that that turned into a, a great way for for our investment process. I mean, we're you know we're an ongoing discussion all the time about ideas and call each other all the time on on things that we should be doing in a portfolio, and it's uh, you know spending time with people that are smarter than you is is key. You know, it's just uh, I mean, it's a uh, for me, that's a, a huge part of my of my life. It's is spend quality time with with people that you're always learning something from them, and Kevin's definitely one of them, a huge mentor for myself. Uh, now, for the people that are not there, I mean, I I you know I started by by reading articles. I I, I read a lot of articles. I would never ever turn a page on an article that I didn't fully understand all the terms on it. And, you know, slowly you start getting used to the terms. The terms in finance are really simple, actually. They just make it look very difficult, but they're very simple. And I don't know if it's just because I have a passion for it, but I I, I, I don't think so. I think they're very simple and they're just, uh, I, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I, I'm always uh, interested in, in knowing them. Um, 
uh, somebody who has a very different opinion than mine, that's uh, that's challenging, right? I mean, it, you 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 tend to uh, disagree with somebody, then you're you kind of want to be close-minded, but uh, but it's important to uh, to not be like that, and it's important to learn how to be very very open-minded about anything that you know any thesis or anything, because anything could really happen in the markets. Nobody knows who's right and who's wrong, and um, and and nobody has a crystal ball here. So um, working really hard. I mean, I'm what I learned about my things was that the more I spend time doing my own analysis, the, the more I, I figure out things that other people wouldn't figure out. So I spend, you know, I, I try to spend like in a, in a good day, I try to spend 60, over 60% of my day on, on doing my own analysis, you know, not reading even the news at that moment. I just want to get the data and have my, my own opinion about that data. And then I read the, 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 you know, other, other people's opinions and see if, if that is in line. And a lot of times tr- trying to understand what's the what's the conventional thought what's what, what are other people thinking and is is it is there a way that maybe there's a contrarian view that is being you know mispriced perhaps and and there is an opportunity i think that's a huge thing for for any hedge fund is really looking for that mispriced opportunity uh, that not everyone is thinking about and um yeah i think that that's that for me worked out really well and uh, and audible books. I mean, I'm a huge fan of that. I, I listen to audible books every time when I go to my car, when I go to grocery store, any, anything that I do, I have an audible book with me. So I'm always, and, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, it, you learn a lot from it. I mean, it's, it's the best MBA you can get <laughs> and it's almost free. It's almost free. It's really cheap for, for how much you learn from it. And it's, uh, you, um, uh, is Crestcat uh, sponsored by audible? No, I, I should. Uh, I should uh, uh, give them a heads up on on what I'm saying yeah. because uh, it's really uh, I, I don't know. It's been a, um, a big help for myself. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a huge audio uh, audio book junkie as well, and and Luke, my my co-host, and and Andy as well. So I can relate to that very much. And Audible, yeah. you're welcome for the free advertisement. <laughs> uh, but 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 this is this is quite interesting. So from what I hear is from 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 your uh, career path so far, the most important thing is uh, uh, is to be curious and and challenge your own ideas and and read and work as hard as, as you can, which is you know things that you that you hear hear a lot uh, from different people but given given you started from scratch as you mentioned um, and you read everything that you could um, and knowing what you know today if, if, if one of our listeners send you an email and say hey you know uh, love what you what you do and and thank you for the interview tell me one two or three things or or, or sources of information or theories uh, that you think I should focus on if I if I want to get into global macro investing yeah, I think let's see. I'm, I'm trying to think about something unique. I, I have, I have more of the conventional answer. Honestly, history is is huge. I'm not sure if that's a conventional kind of answer, but I think history is 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 important. Is understanding history, and um, I didn't live through the '70s. I didn't live through uh, the '40s, the '30s, but I I can get data from there, and I can really see how markets are behaving at the time. So history is. Is 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 very important. I think that uh, your ability to be good with creating models and being um, somewhat tech savvy, I think that's that's very important. Uh, um, some other, you know, kind of more old school macro uh, managers may disagree with this, but I I think that that's you know that has helped me a lot to to uh, express my views, you know, through through creating models. And, and uh, I think that being, uh, I'm not great by any means, but I'm, I'm okay at, at <laughs> creating models and, and being curious and being able to implement, okay, well, that's, you know, uh, how can I create a model like this and, and, and really think it through and, and, and then make it systematic where, you know, you can, you can, you know, have it uh, a lot quicker and uh, things like. I think that that's that's the second thing I, I would focus. I, I wish I would have focused that on in college, really, um, more on on programming and things like that. And now I'm trying to learn on my own, uh, and it's it's challenging. And while well, I said books, I, th- I think I think books are, are a huge advantage. And um, um, for us, I mean, uh, the, the hugest library is is to know English, right? I mean, I, I remember when I didn't know English, it was so hard to understand things and 
uh, now that I do is, is just opens up just a huge amount of source of information that you can read. And um, before beforehand, it was really hard. And uh, by the way, I did not speak English t- t- what, 11 years ago. <laughs> so that was a big change in my life, too. Um, um, and um, I think that another thing to be um, – um, I'm, I'm not successful by any means. I, I'm, I'm trying to be successful, but something I focus a lot on is, is to be – mentally um, healthy and, you know, and, and try to be healthy with my body too. I, I that's one thing that I, I really try to spend my time. Uh, yeah, I'm listening to audible books and whatever, but I'm really trying to, uh, keep myself in shape because I know if I'm not in shape, I'm, it's really difficult for me to, uh, to, uh, to put my ideas out there and, and, and spend quality time with, with family and all that. It's, it's also critical for me. You know, I, I don't have a lot of free time, but when I do, I really try to, uh, to spend with the, my loved ones. So I think that that's, uh, those are, those are the big things for me, um, that I can think of right now. Am I answering your question? <laughs> yeah, you are much better than expected. So thank you. Look, <laughs> I, I mean, you've, you've, you've given me a lot more time than, than I deserve. So I, I wanted to thank you and, and acknowledge, uh, you for, for everything that you've done. I, I love reading your, your research online and I'm, I'm proud to know you and I, and I, I hope you keep on doing what you're doing. And I remember from maybe 10 years ago, uh, when we met, one thing that stood out to me was how curious you were and how much uh, it was crazy how much you paid attention to what people said. You know, you would lock out everything else and just pay attention, which is, you know, a quality that not a lot of people have. So I think I attribute a lot of your success so far to that. So uh, I appreciate you for that. Well, I, I have to say, one, one thing I was planning on saying in this podcast as well was you were, you were a huge um, um, help for, for, you know, for my, especially my early career. I, I remember I saw you as a mentor and it was, um, you were always, you know, um, a step ahead and I was like, wow, how do I get there? <laughs> so I tried to spend a lot of my time uh, learning from you and um, some of the um, the things that you've done that um, that was helpful, and uh, I, I took a bit of a, a different turn in, in, in some ways. Um, and uh, but I, I, I thought that that you know everything that you did for me in my early career was was um, was really uh, helpful, and I I appreciate a lot of it. So um, it, you know I'm, I'm never going to forget that. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. That's that's very kind. All right, thank you. Take care, and I'll talk to you next time. Sounds good, Leo. Hopefully, in, in good times, and um, have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Wall Street Lab podcast. For the show notes and much more, visit us at www.thewallstreetlab.com. To see what we're up to before anyone else, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast constitutes the opinions of individuals and should not be treated as investment, tax, financial or legal advice. We take no responsibility for the accuracy of any statements made in this podcast. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only, and it does not contain an offer to sell or buy any sort of financial products and should not be treated as advertisement for such. Any copying, distribution or reproduction of this podcast without the prior permission of the creators of the podcast is strictly prohibited.